thanks for being here with us today. Thanks for having me. So you've spoken about your parents immigrating to Vancouver in 1967 with $3,200 in their pockets to make better life for their three children. And after arriving here, I had your sister and then you in 1970. Paint a picture for me of that Sim household when you were a young boy, both from a financial and an emotional perspective. Well, from an emotional point of view, I, I think it, it just seemed like a normal childhood um, because it you know, didn't, didn't have a, you know, uh, you know, any reference point, so it was normal. But uh, looking back, it you know it was challenging. Um, I remember I, I went to five elementary schools in seven years, all across the city. Um, you know, I, uh, like East Van, South Van, even on the West Side. Um, I remember in grade four going over to Brandon's house, and I was blown away. They had a VCR, and their fridge was full. Two things that we didn't have at our house, and so I think that was a defining moment for it realize wow well, this is uh, you know, uh, this is uh, a challenging situation the other thing I remember is um, um, you know my mom and dad um, being up at night uh, or in the morning at the kitchen table at three o'clock in the morning and my mom sometimes would have tears in her eyes uh, didn't realize what that meant at the time but in hindsight is they my mom was concerned about where we'd be living that you know the next week did you experience racism while you were growing up in Vancouver and is there a particular incident that's had a lasting impact on you oh for sure there there are lots and, and little subtle things you know um, when I was applying for bank jobs I remember this one bank they uh, they put me through a bunch of interviews and then their last interview was hey why don't you read a research report and then uh, you know write a two-pager on it they were testing my English abilities because no one else in the history of that bank ever had to do that. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I grew up here. I was born here. Um, you know, my second language was French. <laughs> so, you know, so there are these uh, subtle things that, you know, um, I, we've gotten a lot better. But at the same time, you know, it's still out there for sure. You've said gangs targeted Chinese teens when you were a student at Churchill. And as a result, I believe a friend picked a fight with you. Can you elaborate on how the school liaison officer helped you in that situation? Sure. So the situation was I was good friends with, um, I'm, I'm not going to mention his name, mm -hmm. but in grade eight, you know, we're in French class together and, you know, we're buddies. And then by grade 10, uh, he uh, joined it's either the Lotus or the Red Eagles, two prominent gangs at the time. I don't know if they're still around, but um, uh, he joined and one of his, uh, I don't know if it was his initiation, but he had to pick a fight with me. And he, you know, he basically had to jump. He jumped me and started, you know, you know throwing uh, fists at me. And um, and we, you know, we were friends. Um, and he was forced to do it. And if it wasn't for the, uh, you know, school liaison officer program, I'd have nowhere to turn to. And, you know, just their, their presence there, but also having someone to be able to talk to made a big difference. How? Well, just being like someone being there. Right, um, not being fearful at school, um, not having you know I, I could show up at school, um, and if there were any problems, I could actually go there, and I knew there was someone there. So my experience, um, it was actually really helpful. So you stayed at Churchill, I believe, until the end of grade eleven, and then you graduated from McGee in grade twelve. Why did you switch high schools? <laughs> Oh my God, this is going to be recorded too. Um, I had a lot of fun in grade 11. And so uh, I, I missed a lot of classes in French and I, I didn't manage to pass French 11. And uh, McGee was the only school um, anywhere close to where we were living that was on the semester system. So you could actually take 10, 10 courses versus eight. And so, you know, I took French 11 and French 12 so I can get into university. And the ironic thing is uh, French actually became my uh, elective in university and I became conversationally fluent in French. But, but yeah, you know, you, you make mistakes as a kid and, you know, you have to leave your school and all your buddies and your grad year. You know, um, it, it was memorable, that's for sure. So a Churchill student who I spoke with said, he was in your auto class and remembers you driving a convertible Volkswagen with a giant dog as your passenger and that you also liked heavy metal music back then. So can you describe for me what teenage Ken Sim was like? Oh my God, you are, are you guys trying to embarrass me? Yes, I had a convertible rabbit. You know, that's, a, that's one of my skeletons in the closet that I, you know, I'm not too proud about. 
Uh, yeah, no, I, uh, I had a convertible rabbit. Um, the dog was a big chow chow at that point in time. I love, and I still do love heavy metal. Uh, it, it doesn't seem that heavy uh, now, but Van Halen, Iron Maiden, Crocus, uh, you know, uh, Judas Priest, uh, the, the list goes on and on. And uh, no, I, you know, I, I, I love that music. And we would, you know, blare the tunes. It, it was a really weird look. Here's some kid in a convertible rabbit you know, playing You've Got Another Thing Coming by Judas Priest going down the street. It's kind of bizarre now if you think about it. So the public knows you've been an accountant and an investment banker. They know about Nurse Next Door and Rosemary Rock Salt. But you also co-ran another company for, I think, about 15 years called CareSource, which provided staff to care homes. That's been criticized in the past for labor-related issues. Why don't you talk about CareSource on your LinkedIn or your official bio? Yeah, you know, so CareSource was operating for about five or six years. You know, there are a lot of things we just uh, don't talk on uh, the bio because they're not really relevant. Um, but no, it, CareSource was, uh, you know, it was a great opportunity at the time. We were actually really proud of what we did. Um, it was in a, a period where uh, caregivers were getting laid off um, across the province. And a lot of these caregivers were actually, you know, people that we cared about that were you know working at nurse next door as well and so we set up care source as an opportunity to make sure that people had jobs who had been laid off and so we started to get some contracts from uh, different uh, nursing homes and you know at the end of the, end of the day we basically the, the bulk of uh, the operations was basically just uh, providing caregivers and activity aids to uh, uh, facilities that uh, wanted that support it's it's no longer operating now Oh, no, no, no. It, it, you know, over a decade ago, we decided that's, you know, as, uh, you know, beneficial as it was to help, you know, our, our people out. Uh, our core business, uh, what we really care about is making lives better on an in individual basis where we can actually go and do incredible things like actually get into the goals of, you know, our, our clients and see what they want to do. If they want to, you know, if they want to travel, if they want to go into their communities and play mahjong with someone, we get to do those things that you don't get to do in an institutional city. I understand you knew five people who ended up in the downtown east side and that two of them died. Can yeah. you tell me more about these friends and how their experiences shaped your approach to addictions and mental health issues? Sure, obviously I'm not going to mention names, um, but one uh, individual was my um, brother's uh, training buddy, training partner, and uh, you know he actually accomplished a lot. He was Mr. Canada, so people, yeah. And uh, you know he had, you know he had some issues. Uh, you know he had some injuries, got addicted, and um, you know he was a fixture on the downtown east side, and he passed away. There's another person that I went to high school with. Uh, you know, great kid. Um, at 16, uh, the family discovers that he actually has schizophrenia, mm -hmm. and then ends up in the downtown east side after he gets off his meds. So hey, look, we have lots of stories like that, and I think what people need to understand is, um, you, each one of us. Uh, is one step away from ending up in the downtown east side. Um, or, you know, you can struggle with these challenges outside of the downtown east side. These are mental health, addiction, uh, uh, or people experiencing homelessness issues. Um, everyone is someone's son or daughter. And it, when we start looking at it from that perspective, as opposed to judging people, I think we will go a long way in coming up with solutions to tackle the big challenges that we have. Do you commit that your city hall won't cut funding for for services in the downtown east side? What I would commit to is, look, we will um, we'll make sure that uh, services don't get cut, but we're going to hold, you know, we're, we're actually going to look at all our different departments and see what the outcomes are and hold people accountable. And if, if people are doing a great job in various departments, absolutely. And we will, we may even provide more resources uh, to those uh, areas, kind of, kind of like Car 87. Your life now is very different from the life that your parents had when they first came here in 1967 and were raising you and your brothers and sister. And the life you're providing for your boys today is different than the life that you had. Have you maintained a connection with your working class roots? Sure. Um, you know, I, when, I, when I think of our kids, um, our, our kids don't get allowances. Um, they have to basically, you know, earn their keep. So they do jobs. They, they're paying for their own uh, educations beyond, you know, uh, you know the, the base level uh, education uh, going to university. Um, 
our kids go to public school, they went to Trafalgar, they went to kids, because um, I think that's incredibly important to have, you know, uh, diversity of experiences, lived experiences, um, you know, hanging out with normal kids, uh, kids that are, you know, come from uh, struggling families and kids that come from, you know, non-struggling families and, and, you know, different ethnicities. And, um, so I think that's super, uh, super helpful. And then, you know, at Nurse Next Door, um, that, that's, that's the thing that actually keeps me uh, the most humble and down to earth. When I think of all of our caregivers, make no mistake about it, they are better individuals than I ever could be.